Yesterday we talked about tyrannosaurs, and today we're going to move from tyrannosaurs onto one of their potential food sources, uh, which is um, circling back around to duckbill dinosaurs again. Uh, to talk to us today, we have Dr. Andrew Farkey, uh, who is the, I believe I have your title correct, uh, Director of Research and Collections at the Raymond M. Alf Museum in Claremont, California. Um, Dr. Farkey is actually originally from South Dakota, so he's somewhat of a local, so he's coming back out here to talk to us today. I'm sure we've got some people from South Dakota viewing in. Um, and got his PhD from Stony Brook University in New York. Uh, Dr. Farkey usually works on uh, ceratopsy and dinosaurs as one of his main focuses, the horned dinosaurs. Um, but as uh, we've noticed with quite a few of our presenters, you kind of work on whatever you happen to find. And when you make a really great discovery, you shift over and you work on that. So um, what he's going to talk to us about today is a young specimen of the crested duckbill dinosaur, Parasaurolophus. So this is Parasaurolophus walkeri, a slightly different species more than likely than what he's talking about. But you can see it's got this really nice prominent crest coming back here. So he's going to tell us all about uh, this amazing discovery that they made. So I will hand it off. Um, thank you for joining us today, Andy. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's really great to be all of, uh, with all of you. And, uh, you know, of course, a huge thanks to all of you over in North Dakota who are doing some great work uh, with, you know, maintaining uh, some, some cool science communication and science outreach. And of course, talking about dinosaurs and all those other fossils, which is one of my favorite things. Uh, so with that, I think what I'll do is uh, jump right into the presentation. All right, so um, I'm going to today talk about a really neat discovery that was made actually a few years ago now um, by one of the students from my museum. And we're gonna talk about uh, basically, you know, what everything we've learned from this amazing fossil of a little duck-billed dinosaur uh, that was made in Southern Utah. Uh, we're gonna talk about, you know, how the discovery was made, how we excavated it, and also uh, some of the things that we've learned from it. Uh, so to start off, I just want to acknowledge that I'm not the only person who uh, was part of this research. It was really a huge team supported by, uh, you know, many different people at our museum, people who provided funding, in particular the Augustine family, the Terrace family, and others uh, for um, giving us the funds to do this project. Also, a big shout out to the U.S. Bureau of Land Management at Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. Um, the area where we collected this uh, is part of the National Monument, and so we are working under federal permit there. Um, of course, a whole host of other people, uh, uh, including my students, my collaborators, my co-authors, some of whom you'll meet uh, during in the slides during the course of this presentation. So I want to start off with emphasizing that science, you know, really is a, a in many cases a very collaborative endeavor. Uh, so the work you're going to see on these slides isn't just me, uh, but it's the results of hard work from a whole team of people. Okay, so we're going to talk, I'll just introduce the fossil right off the bat. We're going to be talking about this amazing skeleton of a little baby duck-billed dinosaur. Uh, here you see a picture of it. Uh, it's on display um, at our museum in uh, Claremont, California, Southern California, just south, outside of Los Angeles. Uh, it's a virtually complete skeleton of a little animal that was around six feet long uh, when it died. So this was, you know, a very, very young animal. Uh, came along with a really nice skull. Uh, we can see here, here's the skull, that big uh, white thing in the middle is the eye region. You can see the nose to the left of the specimen. And with all this fossil information, uh, we were able to put together a picture of what this animal uh, would have looked like uh, as a complete skeleton, and also how it would have compared uh, to adults of the same species. And so with this really cool discovery, um, it's brought us a whole bunch of information on how this iconic dinosaur called Parasaurolophus uh, would have changed as it grew up from a baby to an adult. So that's a, a quick capsule of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, so now let's get into the details. So the story begins um, in southern Utah within Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. Now my museum has been going out there for a number of years collecting fossils. Uh, this is an area that is in many ways uh, one, of, one of the great dinosaur and fossil collecting fields of Western North America. Uh, it's really rugged. Uh, scientists have known about fossils there for many, 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 many years, decades. Um, 
but it's only in the last 20 or 25 years or so that the collecting uh, intensity has has ramped up as uh, more crews, uh, more more field teams have started to get interested in this. Field teams from uh, my museum, from UC Berkeley, uh, from the Utah Museum of Natural History, uh, the Denver Museum, and others. Uh, so there's a lot of people out there now scouring uh, the slopes of these badlands. Um, and finding some pretty, pretty spectacular fossils. So why are we going out here? Well, these are rocks that date back to around 75 million years ago. Uh, so for those of you in Western North Dakota, you're probably familiar with the Hell Creek Formation. Uh, that's where all your dinosaurs like T-Rex and Triceratops and Thessalosaurus and all those other great animals come from, along with turtles and everything like that. So the rocks that we're looking in in Southern Utah are about 10 million years older. Uh, than those rocks uh, that we find in western North Dakota. Um, and the rocks in southern Utah are from a, a, a group called the Kaparowitz Formation. So the Kaparowitz Formation preserves uh, sediments that were laid down between about roughly 76 and 74 million years ago. At this time, uh, North America, as you see in this map here, was split in half by a big seaway uh, that went up the middle. So basically you could swim from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up uh, to the Arctic Ocean, uh, if you weren't eaten by some of the sea monsters that were around at that time. So there we go. All right, so there's our Kaparowitz Formation. You all heard me talk about that just a few minutes ago. Um, so uh, as a reminder, this is a map of North America around 75 million years ago, uh, made when, uh, this is the time when North America was split in two. And so where that little pink star is right there um, is where we're finding a lot of these fossils. Uh, of course, I want everyone to remember that it's not just the dinosaurs uh, that any of that us or any of the other research teams are after. There's a whole ecosystem. Um, and just as some examples of some of the fossils uh, that, that my museum uh, has found on the next slide, uh, we see the jaw of uh, part of an early alligator. This was an animal that lived right alongside all these dinosaurs, uh, came with a good chunk of a skeleton that represented an animal called Lydiasuchus. On the next slide, um, we have a uh, piece of a bird bone. It doesn't look like much, um, and it is just one fragmentary piece, uh, but it was enough to show that we had a type of bird called an antiornithines. Um, this is it's an extinct uh, group of birds uh, that lived right alongside these dinosaurs. And the exciting thing is after we published uh, this fragmentary bone, uh, another research team led by uh, Dr. Jesse Adderholt from the Western University of Health Sciences uh, described a much more complete skeleton that's housed at UC Berkeley. Uh, so there's all sorts of animals that are coming out uh, from the Kaparowitz Formation. But of course, as we see on the next slide here, uh, the animals uh, that I'm, you know, many of us are interested in are the dinosaurs. And there's just an immense variety of some really, really cool dinosaurs that come out of this Kaparowitz Formation. Uh, many of them related to the animals that lived about 10 million years later. Um, like you'll see in Western North Dakota. So we have large, uh, you know, sort of bird line dinosaurs, animals like Hagriffus on the upper left, Tyrannosaurs, animals like Teratophonius, as you see in the upper right. Uh, there are many kinds of horned dinosaurs, animals like uh, Utah ceratops and Cosmoceratops uh, that, uh, that are, are known from a number of fossils. Uh, but probably one of the most common kinds of fossils that you'll find in the Kaparowitz Formation are the duck-billed dinosaurs or the hadrosaurs. And we're gonna meet those in a little bit more detail uh, there. So uh, my museum, uh, as we'll see on the next slide here, uh, has been going out since uh, the 1990s to uh, search the rocks of the Kaparowitz Formation. This is a big area, so there's a lot of different museum crews that are involved out there. Um, and one of the kind of cool things about my museum uh, is that we're actually on the campus of a high school. Uh, so we're the only nationally accredited paleontology museum that's uh, associated with a high school. And uh, what that means is we can do some really cool things with in, uh, incorporating uh, paleontology into the science classes, uh, doing uh, public outreach for uh, people who aren't at the school, um, and also um, having the students along to help out with a lot of our field expeditions. And this is something we do every summer. So as you'll see on the next slide, uh, here's a group of my students at the uh, site of that fossil alligator uh, relative that we saw earlier. And that site was actually found by a student. Um, so many of our really coolest discoveries are found by students. 
And uh, on the next slide now, let's get to talking about our baby Parasaurolophus. Uh, so for anyone who's maybe not been out in the field before, uh, when you look for fossils, it's not typically just a matter of getting out a shovel and starting to dig a hole. You have to walk around, you have to find stuff. Um, and so that's how we find fossils uh, out in southern Utah, just like uh, most any other place you look. You have to get out, you got to walk around. And that process is called prospecting. Uh, sometimes you'll go a long time without finding much of anything. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, maybe you'll find something right away. So uh, one of my uh, early years uh, that I was out in the Kaparowitz Formation, not long after I'd started my job at the museum uh, here, I was out prospecting with one of my students. Uh, his name is Kevin. Um, and uh, we decided that we were kind of bored of working in our quarry. We wanted to get out and look for some new fossils. Uh, so we started walking and we were uh, moving through the Badlands um, initially pretty quickly because this was an area, at least where we started walking, uh, where a lot of people had already been. You know, this uh, uh, particular area, you know, I had already walked through it once or twice that summer. Um, a number of people had walked through it over the years. And so I was of the opinion uh, that, uh, you know, it probably wasn't going to be, you know, much, it's not worth maybe spending a lot of time there. Um, but you know, on, on this, uh, this, uh, the path that we were taking up to get to the rocks that we were thought gonna be you know, really good, um, Kevin looked under this, uh, this sort of boulder and he saw a little piece of bone sticking out. Um, this is a view of that boulder right there. Uh, I looked at it from a couple feet back and I said, oh, Kevin, it looks like maybe just a fragment of dinosaur bone. You know, it's not really worth um, you know, spending much time on. Because you know, even, even though every fossil is important and it gives us scientific information, sometimes if you have a lot of work to do, you, you can't necessarily collect everything, especially if it's fragmentary stuff. It might just take up space in the collections um, if it's not really part of your collecting protocol. Uh, so like Kevin, you know, we're not gonna bother with this too much. Let's just, uh, let's keep moving. But on sort of on just a, a, a whim, I walked around to the other side of this boulder and there was a little skull or a little uh, piece of rock sitting there. And I picked up this little cobble and I turned it over and on the next slide here you'll see what I saw. And what it was, uh, was part of the skull of a dinosaur staring back at me. Um, and the, where my finger's at, it's sort of pointing towards where the neck bones are. You see part of a lower jaw there just above that. Um, it doesn't look like much, but I recognized right away that, hey, this is this looks like a dinosaur skull. And so I said, Kevin, let's check out that fragment of dinosaur bone that I just told you wasn't that important. Um, and, uh, and so we started brushing it off and it turned out to be a couple of dinosaur toe bones stuck together. Um, they were covered over by dirt. Um, and we brushed a little bit more and we saw skin impressions. And so I got to thinking that, oh, maybe uh, we should, uh, maybe this is a little more important than I thought it was. Uh, so I looked and we had the toe bones on one side of this boulder. We had the skull on another side of the boulder. There was probably a complete dinosaur skeleton in between that. And so as you see on the next slide, um, Kevin, of course, was looking very smug when, you know, he realized that he had been right and I had been wrong about this. And this is a great example of how uh, sometimes you need a lot of eyes, you need a lot of people, um, you know, looking at things and re-looking at them. Um, and also it's always worth, you know, spending just a little extra time, even if you think a discovery maybe isn't that important at first. Sometimes it turns out to be just a scrap of bone. Uh, but in this case, what I thought was a scrap of bone turned out to be most of a dinosaur skeleton. So here we are on the next slide, Kevin posing with some of the uh, fragments of bone that we removed for the summer. Um, so we applied for an excavation permit over uh, the, the next couple months, and then we're able to go back the next summer um, to collect the fossils. So as you'll see on the next slide, we started off with hand chisels. And then on the next slide, you'll see the rock was pretty hard. There was a lot to move. So we had to go into power tools um, and uh, really trim this rock down because it was miles away from the nearest highway, a couple miles from the nearest even uh, dirt road. Uh, so it was gonna be really hard to get out over this rugged terrain. So we wrapped the fossil up in plasters. You'll see on the next slide and the next, and uh, then uh, once it was all ready to go that fall, we came back with a helicopter. As we see right here, we put it into a net. And from this net, uh, the helicopter came along with a long line with a cable that hooked up to it, as we'll see, next slide. And then it flew it on the next slide here um, out to the waiting pickup truck. And this was quite a process. Um, it took a lot of time, a lot of planning. But finally, we got that fossil out of the ground and it was a lot of work, but 
it was also only the beginning of what was still going to be a long process. So back at the museum, on the next slide here, you see fossil preparation started, um, as you see on this. And then as we, uh, as our preparator, um, uh, Mike Stokes got uh, more and more exposed. It became very apparent, as we'll see on the next slide, um, that we had a really cool fossil. There was, even though we thought most of the skull had been eroded away, there was far more of the skull there um, than we had initially thought. And of course, the question was, well, what is this? Based on the toe bones and based on the bits of the skull that I saw, um, we're able to start uh, putting together where this thing might fit on the dinosaur family tree. So on the next slide here, uh, we can see sort of the, the classic uh, organization of dinosaurs um, into their family tree. We have one group that's called ornithischians. Uh, those are the uh, colloquially called the bird-hipped dinosaurs, so animals like Triceratops and Stegosaurus and Hadrosaurus and all those. And our other group is cl called the Saurischians. That includes our, our tyrannosaurs, our theropods, sauropod dinosaurs, and of course, today's birds. Based on uh, what we, uh, we saw, uh, we knew that it was probably a ornithischian dinosaur, not just probably, it was an ornithischian dinosaur. And specifically within that, as we see on the next slide here, um, it was a hadrosaur, also known as a duck, duck billed dinosaur. Um, so hadrosaurs, uh, as we see next, are divided into two flavors, um, hadrosaurines, sometimes called saurolophines, and lambiosaurines. Or as I like to think of them, as we see here, um, I think of them as the boring and the not boring hadrosaurs. And why do I say that? Well, um, it's a little bit of, a, you know, maybe a unfair against the boring hadrosaurs. Uh, but you can, if you look at the skulls on these, you know, really the skulls on those lambiosaurines are pretty exciting. They have these cool crests of all different shapes and sizes, some like dinner plates, some like hatchets stuck in the top of their head, some like big tubes. Um, really, really interesting skull anatomy happening in these. And the skull anatomy on each of those is very unique to particular species. So going to the next slide, um, what we knew um, uh, from these is that our, uh, looking at just this little skull, it had some stuff happening on the top of the head. And what we know from the Kaparowitz formation um, is there's only, as far as we know uh, right now, two main species or two main types of hadrosaurs. There's one hadrosaurine, one of those boring hadrosaurs called Gryposaurus, that has still kind of a cool bump on its nose, um, but it doesn't compare anywhere close to this big animal called uh, that has the tube crest on top of it. And there have been a number of uh, really nice uh, adult Parasaurolophus skulls found. Um, and so just by process of elimination, we suspected, uh, we knew that our, our baby wasn't a hadrosaurine, it wasn't a gryposaurus, but it was probably one of these lambiosaurines, and that meant it was probably Parasaurolophus. Even though it didn't have the big crest on its head, as we talk about later, as I'll talk about later, we know that the shape of these dinosaur skulls changed as they grew. Um, and we also know uh, that um, there's other features on the skull, details of the cheekbone, details of uh, some of the other bones that are very consistent with what we know for, uh, for Parasaurolophus at a larger size. So as we see on the next slide, we know that this animal would have probably gone from looking something like this, quite small, to something that looked like this as an adult animal. Um, so we strongly suspected that we had a baby or at least a very young uh, Parasaurolophus. Uh, so this was going to give us a lot of information about, um, um, uh, about this animal. So the next question was, well, you know, we know this is a small animal, uh, but maybe how old was it when it died? And so uh, for that, I decided to collaborate uh, with a bone biologist, a histologist uh, by the name of Dr. Sarah Werning. Uh, Sarah is uh, one, of an, one of the experts on dinosaur bone and the, the bone in many different animals and reading that bone to try and figure out uh, how these animals grew. And as we'll see on the next slide here, this is a slice of bone, uh, an image that uh, Dr. Werning provided, showing a section through, uh, a, I think it's a, a crocodilian uh, limb bone. And one of the neat things about the bones in many animals is that as they grow, um, they lay down rings like you see on the rings of a tree. So with some, uh, with some exceptions, you can count up the rings and get an estimate of 
roughly how old that animal was when it died. Now, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, sometimes you, you lose these rings as bone remodels and resorbs, uh, but particularly for younger animals, you might be able to get a pretty reliable uh, direct estimate here. So uh, as we'll see on the next slide, we took a small sample of bone from the, uh, the thigh bone, the tibia, um, and then I sent it off to Dr. Werning. Um, so we see on the next slide, she embedded it in resin. Um, and as on the next slide here, um, that uh, got turned into a microscope slide. And then as we looked at it under the microscope, as Dr. Werning looked at it, interpreted it, um, one of the things that was pretty apparent, um, and as we see on this next cross section here, is that unlike what we would expect to see in adult animals, there were no growth rings um, that we saw at all in this little dinosaur. And so what that suggests is that this was probably, as seen on the next slide, this was a genuine uh, baby dinosaur. And next slide again. Um, and so the idea is that um, although we can't be entirely certain because there are sometimes uh, quirks in how bone is laid down, um, it's quite possible that this animal might have been under a year old when it died. And so as we see on the next slide here, for comparison, what that looks like, uh, this is me and this is uh, on, the, on the lower right there is my, uh, my oldest, who's now seven. Um, but uh, that's him uh, crawling along when he was just under a year, year old. Uh, so that's my kid, a human, um, next to a baby dinosaur that might be about the same age. And so that tells us a lot about how fast these animals might have grown. Uh, so an animal is going from a little hatchling, smaller than a human infant, to something about the size of a large dog in under a year, potentially. And this is not something new that we discovered for our specimen. Other scientists have documented this in other animals. Um, but we do know that um, you know, this, this shows that our Parasaurolophus was pretty consistent with with what we know about other dinosaurs. So it was growing really quickly. And then based on studies that other uh, people have done with other hadrosaurs, uh, it might have been reaching adult size in 10 years, maybe 15 years. So going from something smaller than a human infant to something you know, the, almost the size of an elephant um, in about the time it takes for a human to grow from a baby to a teenager. So that's really, really, really fast growth. Okay, so our next, um, Next slide there is a nice picture of me with uh, holding that skull, uh, baby skull, the real one, next to a cast of a Parasaurolophus. So what it's telling us um, is that another, another neat thing is that the skulls of these animals changed quite a bit as they grew. Again, we knew this for other animals. It's fairly well known, and it's been known for, for quite a while now that, now that dinosaur skulls changed shape as they grew. Um, but this was the first time we really had a good picture of how it happened in Parasaurolophus. So on the next slide there, uh, uh, we'll skip this next one here. So with our, uh, our not boring dinosaurs, one of the ways that they uh, might have gotten this great variety in crest shape is by speeding up or slowing down the way that they grew their skull. And so as we see on the next slide, this is gonna be our one like super, super, super fancy word, uh, heterochrony. So just changing the timing of growth. So the way that Parasaurolophus might have gotten its really fancy crest relative to some of its other relatives uh, might have been by uh, basically starting to grow its crest quicker. So basically one part of its head had a growth spurt before any other part of the skull. And so that's how this animal might have, uh, have been able to evolve to get this really weird looking tube-like crest on its head. So that's just the external picture. Next, another thing we were interested in was looking at the internal picture. And so we were able to partner with one of our local hospitals, the Pomona Valley Medical Center, uh, to get uh, CT scans or CAT scans of the inside of the skull. And so it basically uses x-rays, just like uh, you would if you were to get a medical scan, um, to look inside the fossil, as we see on the next slide here. And what that can tell us is something about the shape of the brain, the shape of the nose passages, and all of this. And so on the next slide, uh, what we were able to see is we were interested in mapping out the nose passages. So scientists have, uh, have thought um, that, you know, because they had this weird crest, there were some really complicated nose passages going through it. Not like that relatively straight passage that humans have, but it did sort of these curves and loops and all this stuff. And so it's been suggested that maybe it was related to uh, producing sound. So as we looked and reconstructed our CT scan, as seen on the next slide here, uh, we're able to get the, uh, the path of those nose passages in green. And what's interesting is when we compare it with what it looked like in an adult Parasaurolophus, 
um, as shown in this cross section on the upper right in blue there, um, our baby Parasaurolophus had a much shorter and a much less complicated uh, passage of uh, passages in its nasal cavity. So as I mentioned, scientists have, said, uh, have suggested that these nasal passages might have been able to uh, produce sounds or help amplify and, and, and make sounds resonate, uh, kind of like playing a brass instrument, like a trumpet or a trombone. And if you've ever seen someone play a trombone or if you've played a trombone yourself, you know that you can either pull the, push the tube out long and get a really deep note, or you can pull it in and get a higher note, higher pitch, um, because the length of the passage that the sound has to travel determines the pitch of that sound. So a short passage um, is high sound, a long passage is a lower sound. So the way I like to think of it for our baby dinosaurs, because it had a very short set of nasal passages, um, that's a good reminder that its sounds uh, that it produced would have been uh, kind of squeaky compared to the adults, which would have been sort of like, you know, the bass on, the, on that end of the sound system. Uh, so this is telling us a little bit about maybe how the voice changed on these animals as they grew up. Okay, so we got a little idea about what's inside the skull, uh, what's inside the nasal passages, and how that might have uh, affected uh, the way that this animal sounded as it grew up. Uh, but we also have some other really cool uh, just um, pieces of anatomy we saw. And I saw one of the people in the questions had asked about if there was any soft tissue preservation with this. And so let's take a look at the next slide uh, to see that. As I mentioned earlier, we had some skin impressions with our fossil uh, in a few patches, not all over the body, but just a few patches. Um, nothing nearly as nice as, uh, of course, on, uh, on Dakota that you all have there um, at your museum. But uh, we have, um, as we were preparing the skull, as our preparator was working on the skull, he actually found an area that had some unusual uh, patterns on it, as we'll see on the next slide. So we're going from the side view to the front view. You see the eye there, the nose. And then at the front of it, um, as we'll go through the next slide, and then the next slide, there was something that looked kind of like one of those Ruffles potato chips. Um, and that was right in the spot where we would expect to find the beak of the animal. And there have been fossils of older adult hadrosaurs that have shown a similar texture there um, that shows uh, that basically we, we, we think, we know, uh, was uh, the impression of the beak. So the beaks on many animals are made out of keratin, so sort of like our fingernail that extends well beyond the bone of the skull. We see this in turtles, we see this in birds, and we know that this also happened in dinosaurs. So what's neat about that is it tells us something about how these animals would have been chewing with that sort of ruffled ridge on it. It might have helped them be a little bit better at chopping off plants. And also from the uh, perspective of you know, someone that's maybe illustrating dinosaurs, uh, someone drawing dinosaurs, uh, it shows that you, know, you can't necessarily go just by what we see on the skull. As we see on the next slide here, if we only use the bony outline of Parasaurolophus, this is what we think it might have looked like in life. But if you account for that soft tissue we had, that keratin, uh, that really changes the picture of this animal. So we knew that at least, you know, if we want to it, uh, describe it artistically, you really got to think about what kind of soft tissue might not be illustrated or referenced on the bones. So it tells us about how these animals feed, but it also tells us about how these animals uh, might have looked when they were alive. So that's a lot about the biology of this animal. We've learned a tremendous amount of things uh, about it. So we know that it was a very young animal when it died. We know that it had, um, had nasal passages that would have changed shape as the animal grew uh, that might have influenced how it uh, sounded relative to adults. Maybe that tells us a little bit about how these dinosaurs communicated with each other. Uh, we know that uh, it had you know, this, this carrot and beak that made the skull look very differently from uh, how we would think just from the bone. Uh, so there's all these different things uh, that we learned. So the, um, it's a tremendous amount of information. Uh, and that's been uh, brought along with a lot of scientific research. So um, working with some of my students, working with my collab, uh, Anissa Herrero, Derek Chalk, um, and uh, Brandon Scolieri, who are both hi all high school students. Um, uh, at the time we were doing this research, working with Dr. Sarah Warning, we were able to put together a scientific paper, publish it, and get it out there uh, for the scientific community and the world to learn about. 
Uh, so as we see on the next slide, our fo the fossil is normally on display at my museum, uh, our museum here in uh, Claremont, California, uh, but it's also been on display all over the world. As we see on the next slide, uh, a couple years back, it went on tour to Japan, where it was seen uh, by, by uh, nearly a million people uh, while it was on display um, in several cities there. So it's been able to be seen by the world. Uh, but also, uh, we want to make sure as a museum that anyone, uh, maybe those who, aren't, who didn't necessarily see it when it was in uh, Tokyo, maybe people that didn't see uh, the dinosaur went, or can't you know, come to Southern California to see it. Um, so we wanted to make sure it's as easy to get to um, as any dinosaur out there, uh, especially for those you know, that might be you know, from some of the areas where these dinosaur fossils are found. So we put together a website, um, as seen on the next slide here, uh, called dinosaurjoe.org. Um, if you haven't been there before, I encourage all of you after this presentation uh, to go check it out. Um, what we've done um, is if you want to learn more about some of the science um, that, uh, that I talked about in these slides, maybe get some of the other details, learn about some of the people um, behind this, you can check out that website, see on the next slide here. Um, it's uh, also uh, got not just uh, you know, text information, but it has digital versions of the skeleton that you can look at. Um, and there's downloads for PDFs, as you can see on the next slide, uh, 3D PDFs that have the color and all that. Uh, we also have the skull that you can look at. Um, if you want to learn more about those nasal passages that I talked about earlier, uh, seen on the next slide, you can see parts of the brain. Uh, I've got the brain and other things uh, that are all able to download. And in fact, if you have access maybe through your school or at home or a friend uh, to a 3D printer, um, you could even print out some of the things uh, from, this, uh, from this fossil. So we have all the files available for 3D printing, for viewing on your phone, on your computer, uh, wherever you like. Uh, so we really want to make sure that this is, uh, you know, one of the most digitally accessible dinosaurs out there. And I'm really proud of the fact uh, that, that our museum was one of the first museums to put a full dinosaur skeleton online. Others have, have followed since, of course, um, but it's been really great uh, to make sure that as many people as possible, uh, not just those who can come directly to the museum, uh, can see this fossil. Uh, so with that, um, let me uh, finish up uh, this, uh, just to summarize, you know, we have this great fossil of a baby dinosaur, something that was probably around a year old when it died, give or take. Um, and it tells us a lot about how this animal grew, how quickly it grew from a hatchling up to a yearling to something much larger as an adult. Uh, we know, as seen on the next slide, that these animals uh, changed their skull shape quite a bit. And uh, with that, there's been just a tremendous amount of information that we've learned. So with that, um, I'll finish up and want to thank you, encourage you to visit the websites for the baby dinosaur, uh, for my museum. And, uh, you know, and certainly, you know, I'm happy at this point to, to dive into the questions. All right. Thank you very much. So one question from the chat was, uh, how, how did the, the beak imprint itself in the rock? Yeah, so that's a good question. And I'm not entirely sure on that. I know some other people have looked at uh, kind of the way that these things preserve. That's a science called taphonomy. Uh, so basically how things fossilize. Um, what I think probably happened is, is you know, even though keratin isn't as resistant as bone to decay, I think it's, uh, it's stuck around just long enough uh, with the fossil of the or with the animal after it died that left an impression on the rock or maybe a hollow space in the rock that was later preserved. So it's probably an impression. We don't see the actual uh, keratin, at least in this case. Uh, is there is there any idea how the animal died? Um, does does the surrounding rock or sediment give any indication of that? Yeah, unfortunately, we don't know anything about how this animal died. Um, there's no evidence, you know, that it was, uh, that we can see that it was eaten by a predator or killed by a predator. Um, you know, maybe, you know, a lot of young animals, uh, particularly in the wild, die of things like disease and that. So, you know, we just, there's no immediate clues on the bone uh, to tell us anything about how this particular animal died. So I think that's going to be, at least for now, a mystery, maybe forever a mystery. How rare are baby dinosaur fossils, and do you know how many have been found? Yeah, so that's a that's a really interesting question, and it's uh, it's kind of a it's a hard one to answer directly um, because it turns out as uh, scientists and paleontologists and people out in the field start looking for baby dinosaurs, we're actually getting a lot better at finding them, and I think a lot better at identifying them. Um, 
it turns out if you go back to historic museum collections, baby dinosaurs have been collected for a long, 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 long time. I've seen fossils in collections, you know, that, that go back to maybe 1900 that have, uh, that have uh, di you know, pieces of dinos baby dinosaurs in them. Uh, however, in, in many, especially in these early, in the early days of museum collecting, scientists were after uh, you know, maybe the really big, complete, spectacular specimens that could go on exhibit. And maybe if it was a fragment of a bone, um, it wasn't as, or maybe just a single bone, it wouldn't be as, as interesting. And so genuine baby dinosaurs for a long time weren't that well known, with a couple exceptions, animals like protoceratops and even some hadrosaurs had at least maybe like a yearling or, or you know, a year or two old animals uh, known. But for baby dinosaurs, um, as, as we've started to look now, it actually in some places it turns out they're fairly easy to find, or at least pieces of them are fairly easy to find. Um, and uh, that, you know, that's uh, some great work done by, you know, over the years by folks like at Museum of the Rockies, you know, when you start looking for baby dinosaurs, you find baby dinosaurs. Uh, so yeah, they're, they're finding complete skeletons is rare, I would say, because they do tend to, you know, they're small, they're bite size, scavengers uh, eat them up pretty fast and their bones are a little bit delicate. Uh, so they may not preserve as well as some others, but uh, you know, so complete skeletons like this are fairly rare, uh, especially in North America. Um, but uh, finding bits and pieces of them is maybe a little more common than you might think. Great question. All right, so here, here's a little silly one. Um, so we've heard a couple of different pronunciations. So oh, which yeah. emphasis goes on which syllable? Is it Parasaurolophus or Parasaurolophus? So it's, it's like Leviosa. We'll get a little Harry, yeah. Harry Potter thing going on here. Yeah. I, I mean, so the, so the obvious answer is that my pronunciation is the correct one. Uh, but but uh, I mean, re realistically, uh, you know, these, these words that we have are formed out of languages that haven't been actively spoken for hundreds, if not, you know, a thousand or two thousand years. Um, so I think, it, it, you know, it's also like I have my own, you know, regional uh, uh, fix on these. So you could pronounce it parasaurolophus, you could pronounce it parasaurolophus. You could pronounce it whatever you know you want. I think there's really no. I've, some people are very linguistic purists, and they say, "Well, you must put the emphasis ex exactly here because this is how the ancient Greeks would have, uh, you know, spoken it." But I'm not an ancient Greek. Nobody else around alive today is an ancient Greek person. Um, <laughs> so uh, you know, I think there's there's a lot of, of uh, latitude to that. Yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, I think you know, I'm I'm not going to uh, tell you you're a bad paleontologist if you pronounce it differently from me. Just don't call it a T-Rex. I'm a bad paleontologist for many other reasons other yeah. than my pronunciation. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm happy to say that, that I am then a good paleontologist because I pronounce it your way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so finding these baby dinosaur bones hidden in collections and say you find a small fragment or whatever, um, how can you tell or how can you identify that it's actually a baby dinosaur and not just a small chunk of bone? Yeah, so some of that takes just uh, a lot of practice looking at a lot of different kinds of bones um, so you can recognize what it is. Uh, one clue that I look for often is, of course, small size is a clue, um, but there's a lot of small adult dinosaurs too, and there's small adult other animals, so size isn't perfect. Another thing you can look for is bone texture. Uh, when you see a, a, a an adult dinosaur bone, uh, typically it has a very smooth texture, kind of almost a polished texture on the outside. Uh, baby and young animal bone tends to be a little bit porous. Uh, so um, maybe not to the extent of being spongy, but it does have sort of a rough, almost porous surface. Um, one way you might be able to spot this in your own life is if, you know, if you're someone that, that ever eats chicken or whole chicken, um, look for those parts of the bone that are maybe a little bit rough, not quite smooth. Most of the chickens we eat are actually fairly young animals. Um, they're grown quickly to get to a certain size. They don't worry about them living to a ripe old age. They, uh, you know, they they get them to, you know, they're still pretty young animals. And so they'll have this young animal bone texture. Uh, so if you look at um, a typical chicken bone, uh, especially like a thigh bone, sometimes it'll have that uh, that sort of rough texture on the surface that I talk about. So that's that's probably the best way to do it. And if you want to really like have your you know 100% sure uh, method or 95% sure method, is then you can uh, slice a little piece of that bone up. 
um, and look at the bone structure because young animals tend to have different uh, microstructure in their bones from old animals, as we talked about earlier, you know, things like those growth rings and that. Yeah, that's a great question. And sometimes, like, honestly, people, you know, they'll look at a bone, one person will say, oh, this has to be a baby, and another person will look at it and says, oh, no, it has to be an adult, and so then, you know, there's arguments about that, too. Uh, but usually we can, as we look at more and more lines of evidence, uh, you know, get, you can be a, a little more confident on it. So looking at different, multiple lines of evidence, not just size, not just bone texture, but looking at everything uh, possible. Have you been able to obtain any DNA from Joe? Oh no! <laughs> Sadly, no. This is uh, the 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 uh, you know there might be proteins and stuff in that, which sometimes you know we have been found to survive in some of these fossils. Uh, and maybe you know someday we'll find a technique to extract you know little bits of DNA. But we we haven't looked and and you know given you know the way that this animal you know how old it is um, and given how quickly DNA degrades, you know the chances of finding any DNA are very 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 small. Um, practically non-existent. And also something like this that sat out on the surface, you know, or even under the surface, there's lots of chances for contamination. So yeah, I think the chance of ever getting DNA out of a specimen like this, or really most specimens, is, is uh, pretty slim to none, sadly. All right, looks like that is, we've worked our way through the chat, we've worked our way through the Q&A, so that is uh, all of the questions, unless any of the other panelists have anything. A bunch of no. <laughs> yeah, cool. Well, that's some great questions. Thank you so much to everyone for those. All right. Well, thank you so much for, for chatting with us. Uh, I, I am a fan of, of the boring dinosaurs. I, I like the boring end of the tree. I get to work with Edmontosaurus. So it's kind of fun working uh, or seeing, seeing more information about the, the non-boring end of the tree, too. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us um, and take care, stay safe. And we'll talk to you later. Tomorrow we'll be moving on to uh, bite marks on bones and what we can interpret from those. So join us again at the same paleo time on the same paleo channel. We'll see you all tomorrow. <laughs>